hi, I get to see what Fred Clark really looks like. <laughs> 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 so tonight we're really privileged to have Fred Clark of Sunset Valley Orchids in Vista. Fred has been growing orchids for 42 years and has been hybridizing for 38 of those years. With over 34 years as a professional grower and manager in the horticultural industry, Fred applies these skills at his orchid nursery, Sunset Valley Orchids, located in San Diego, California. As you can see, he's a passionate orchid grower whose curiosity in orchids is broad and varied. Although developing Catalea hybrids has been his sustaining interest, he, he has also actively created new Paphilopedia Paphiopedilum and Osiodendrobium hybrids, plus some others to be named if they work out. His pioneering work in Catasetum intergeneric hybrids led to the development of this beautiful hybrid and this thing called Grex, Fred Clark Ara After Dark, which is the blackest flower ever witnessed. This Grex has received over 100 awards worldwide with nine FCCs and 30 AMs from the AOS judges. Fred is also an accredited judge in the Pacific South judging region. His plants has, have received hundreds of quality awards from the American Orchid Society. His talk tonight is supported by a generous donation from our members, Ian Sanderson and Kate Leonard. So without further ado, here is Fred Clark, this famous guy <laughs> that we all now nobody looks like. And uh, he'll be speaking to us tonight and we're very uh, privileged to have him. Thank you, Fred. All right, well, thank you very much for that introduction. I don't, I don't know if I'm that great, but <laughs> <laughs> let's see here, uh, share screen. Oh, I got you, can you share oh, my screen for yeah. me? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I'm gonna make you co-host. Okay. And it should work now. Ah, there it is. All right. <clears throat> so tonight we're gonna talk about something that I really enjoy and that is catacetums, cycnoches, mormotes, and catacetums for that matter, and a few other things. You know, I started growing orchids when I was when I was 18 years old, and um, I I uh, I guess I blame the neighbor lady because she recruited me to help her repot her plants, and I remember I must have worked cheap because I don't remember any money exchanging hands. But I do remember her giving me a stack of orchid magazines. And in there was an advertisement for the San Diego show. And I went to the show in my light blue Ford Pinto station wagon. <laughs> and I bought two big boxes of orchids and brought those home. And sure enough, I got the bug and it's been 43 years ever since. But on that, on that journey of mine, I learned I wanted to distinguish my collection. I wanted to have something unique and different that no one else was growing. And that's when I discovered Catacete and I. There was just a few growers. And so let's start off. Sick no cheese. How do you pronounce it? I've heard it pronounced sick no keys. Might be right. I've heard it pronounced seek no keys. And that sounds like it could be right. Or seek no cheese. Pretty sure that's not right. But the proper pronunciation is sick no keys with the emphasis on the no, sick no keys. The species sick no keys have dramatic swan shaped flowers. There's three new species that have been introduced into cultivation that's really reinvigorated interest in this group. They're easy to grow. They have beautiful foliage. They have male and female flowers. This is an orchid that has male and female flowers. This is very unusual. 
The genus is also divided into two sections, the Eusychnokes and the Heteranthi section. We'll talk about those a little bit. And then finally, they make excellent hobby plants. So Cygnoches cooperi is one of the most spectacular of the newly discovered Cygnoches. It's a heteranthi, and the heteranthi Cygnoches have male and female flowers that are dissimilar. And so if you look at the picture on the left, you can see there's two types of flowers. There's the larger, more bronze colored flower. That's the male or the female, excuse me with the big showy lip. And on the right-hand side, the mini flowered inflorescence is the male flowers. And then on the far right-hand side, that is an inflorescences of all males. So you can see the difference between male and female flowers. Now I've Cooperi is one of my favorites, and so I've been acquiring them for years. And this Cooperi received a first class certificate, has extremely large flowers, beautiful flat shape, broad segments. And on the right are the males, and on the left are the females. Cooperi comes in two different color forms. There is this brownish form, which is the typical form. And then on the right, there's this green colored form. And this green form is very rare. It's been elevated to a subspecies level and they gave it a name that's not that easy to pronounce. You can see there in the bottom corner and the proper pronunciation is Ayacuchoensis. And so, Let's see here, I'm admitting a couple people, waiting room, joining the uh, Ayacuchoensis. And so it's named for a place. Ayacucho is a province in Northern Peru and ensis from the Latin means place of. So this name means the Cooperi from Ayacucho. This green color form is extremely rare. Now, next on the list of heteranthes, that means the male and female flowers are dissimilar looking, is Barthiorum. And Barthiorum has a very complex coloration and it has a lip, that white lip is almost, is reminiscent of a, of a, of a spider, I guess you could say. It looks like the legs of the spider. So these are the males and these are the female flowers on the same plant just a different blooming. So male and female, completely different from one another. And then there's a close relative to Barthiorum. It's similar in flower shape and in lip structure, but of course the color has this chartreuse tone. These are the males and these are the females. So very unusual. Then there's Cygnoches vorsavixii, and vorsavixii is the plant that got me hooked, really, on wanting to grow catacetini as a whole. I got this plant years ago, and I exhibited it, and I received an award of merit from the American Orchid Society for this. Vorsavixii is characterized by its horizontal petal stance. You can see if you drew a straight line right across there, how horizontal it is. It's also commonly named the swan orchid and it's hard to see it, but maybe on this flower on the far right hand side where my pointer is, let's see here, let me try this, draw. So if this was the body of the swan and this is the neck and the head and this is the surface of the water, does that look like it might have to turn your head on its side a far wit bit, but does that look like a swan a little bit? Well, maybe it does. <laughs> Obviously, somebody thought it did back in the day when they named this the swan orchid. So this is a Eusignoches, 
different from its heteranthi relatives. So here, the male and female flowers are similar. These are pictures of males, and here is another male. I forgot I added this picture. The males have long, slender columns, and the pollinia is out on the end. This is the female. Do you see the difference? Here's the male with that long, slender column in the pollen on the end. And here's the female with a short, broad column, and there's no pollen here on the end. Now, Cygnoches make amazing hybrids. And so one of the first hybrids was Cooperi crossed with Bartheorum, and it was named for a gentleman in Florida, a guy named Jean Monier. I think he now lives in Hawaii. The cross was quite successful. It was actually made uh, by several people at the same time. And the Jean Moniers have been very good. This is a typical picture of what it would look like, but some look like this with darker coloration. Others were more reddish. This cross was made by Roy Tokunaga. And then, oh, I guess that's the last one. Then another hybrid was made. This is one that I made, Heron Husseinum and Vorsavixii, name, Greg's name for my son, Kevin. And this is what Kevin Clark looks like. It's a combination of a heteranthi and a eusignoches. And if you look real closely, you can see there's gold spots on the yellow flower. Next on the list, uh, you know, any hybridizer worth his salt is trying to make improvements and do things that have never been, been done before. Um, hybridizing is a bit like being an artist. And if you're an artist, you want to create art that's new and different. So one of the things I was thinking about is how can you get new colors into Cygnoches? Taking the bronze kind of rose color of Bartheorum, cross it with the chartreuse hair and Husseinum. I was hoping to get red flowers. The first plant bloomed, well, it was tangerine. So it is the new color for Cygnoches. And then it had those red spots. I named this for my wife. So it's my wife's namesake, Martha Clark. We continued and started doing some more advanced breeding. So we took Vorza Vixii, crossed it with Jean Monnier, and made Richard Brandon. And Richard Brandon set a new standard of quality in the hybridization of Cygnoches with excellent flower quality and uh, flower shapes. We took Kevin Clark, remember those gold spots? And we crossed it with Cygnoches vorsavixii and made pineapple popcorn. And you can see the background color is kind of greenish. And you can see the little pronounced yellow spotting on that green background. Someone should make pineapple popcorn, don't you think? Sounds very Hawaiian at the least. And then vorsavixii with Martha Clark made Marin Gleason, and these have been very successful as well. High flower count and yellow with red spots. And so how about um, this cross, Vorza Vixii and Swan Cascade, was just a very impressive looking flower, sevenfold, the sevenfold increase over what came before. And then Crimony. So, Crimony is what I said when I fought, saw that seedling bloom. Kevin Clark by Richard Brandon. And oh my gosh, the burnt orange with those burgundy spots beginning to coalesce on the flower and the white lip. So, if you, so this made me think that if you could coalesce a whole bunch of burgundy spots, what color swan orchid would you have? Would you have a black swan? And so it put, put me on a path. And so we crossed Richard Brandon and Martha Clark. Well, that produced a beautiful yellow with burgundy spots. And then we did this. 
Richard Brandon and Clarange and made Dark Swan. And this was the first one to bloom. And you can see how the spotting is beginning to coalesce. I continued to flower a few plants and this one bloomed. Oh, very close to having black swans. So we're not there yet because you can't quite call that black. We're maybe one or two generations away now before the elusive black swans appear. And so Mormodes, so that was the Cycnoches. So what about Mormodes? They're referred to as the goblin orchid. The flowers are twisted and contorted. The Mormodes flowers, they're perfect. That means they're just like almost every other orchid you know. Each blossom has the male and female components in it. And this is Mormodes laurentiana. Mormodes have a very contorted flower shape. The, the dorsal sepal and the petals come forward. The lateral sepal juts back. The lip is curved. It's, it's almost, you could call it saddle shaped where it's curved and the side lobes come down. They bloom on leafless pseudobulbs in the winter. Then there's Mormodes uh, elegans, the elegant Mormodes. Look at the beautiful coloration. There's Mormodes sinuata. You can see the red color, but look at the form. The lip curls up and it touches the dorsal and both petals and the side lobes are sticking out to the side. How about Marmodes hookeri? That's pretty, one of my favorite Marmodes species. Look at the lip. It looks like a piece of velvet. And in fact, it feels like velvet. If you touch it, it's got a hirsute or hairy kind of a fuzzy feeling. Then there's Marmodes ignea. Beautiful coloration. And so we started making hybrids with these things. So we, this was one of the first crosses. We crossed Marmodes sinuata with hooker eye. And I, I sell plants all around the world and I shipped a bunch of these down to a guy in Venezuela. And uh, he flowered the first one and he called me up and he said he would, he was so proud, you know, of blooming the first one and wanted to register. And I said, all right, well, that's fine. What name do you want to register it as? And so he said, Virgin, Virgen del Valle, which translated from Spanish means Virgin of the Valley. Now, so when a guy wants to name an orchid Virgin of the Valley, you kind of get a little bit of an idea of, you know, the things that are important in their life. I had an, another name in mind. This is a cross of Sinuata and Hookeri. So although I didn't say it to him, I thought a better name for this cross would have been Sinful Hooker. And so when you submit a registration to the Royal Horticulture Society, you have to send in two names, uh, the, uh, the, the primary and an alternate. So I filled out the form and I put Virgin of the Valley on the top line and I put Sinful Hooker on the bottom line. And this was back in the day where you put it in the envelope and you mailed it. I mailed it off to him. And I remember sitting up bolt upright in bed in the middle of the night thinking to myself, what are they going to think of me? I, you know, what kind of guy is this Mr. Clark? He's got Virgin of the Valley and Sinful Hooker on the same registration. Well, about three weeks later, I got it back and they had accepted the name Virgin of the Valley. And I was greatly relieved because if they would have selected Sinful Hooker, I would have had to told my customer in Venezuela that the name isn't Virgin of the Valley, it's Sinful Hooker. And how would have that gone? So a few years later, I met the, the guy Jan, uh, from Venezuela. And when I was talking to him, I realized that maybe he wasn't as uh, the kind of guy I thought he was from the naming of his orchids. And so I, I had said to him, hey, you know, I named this, I wanted to name this cross Sinful Hooker, you know, but I didn't want to say anything to you because you wanted to call it Virgin of the Valley. 
And he started laughing and laughing. And he said, Fred, you know what virgin of the valley means? And I, I said, well, yeah, it's the virgin. Of, he says, no, 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 no. In Venezuela, in Spanish, when you say virgen del valle, that's like saying, oh, my gosh. And so it's an expression of, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, of excitement. So he was so excited that this bloomed. It was like, oh, my gosh, Mormodis. Had nothing to do with the virgins or the valley. Just, oh, my gosh. True story. So we continued breeding with Mormodis. And we took virgin of the valley and crossed it with Jumbo Bacchia and made Mark Mills. Beautiful red lips. We took exotic treat and crossed it with Rolfiana. This made nitty gritty, beautiful coloration. Marmotis have fantastic colors. How about this one? Here's Virgin of the Valley and nitty gritty. Look at the striping and look at the pink lip. Just gorgeous. Very unusual and different from the normal type of orchids that you would see. And then Marmotis Aftermath. I did end up naming a hybrid Midnight Hooker after all. The, uh, and so Midnight Hooker and Mark Mills makes Aftermath with this very unusual neon kind of orange color. And so more Modis. We're spending a lot of time talking about them. But why are we doing this? It's because they make magnificent hybrids. So you take a Mormodis and you cross it with a Cygnotes and you get this. Cygnotes Midnight Magic. And so let's put on our breeding caps here for a minute. And I want you to just carefully read this and think about this. When you combine the two genera, a Cygnotes and a Mormodes, it makes a new genus called the Cygnotes. The Cygnotes imparts flower size, shape, and color. And the Mormodes gives color and count. Okay, so Cygnotes is size and shape, and Mormodes is flower count and color. So here is the test. You take Cygnotes vorsavixii, and you cross it with Mormodes frimeiri. And you can see frimeiri has kind of a light pink lip. And you see the stripes on the petals and sepals. Those stripes are made up of coalesced dots. So remember the shape of the Cygnotes and the color of the Mormodes. So in your mind's eye, try to visualize what the offspring will look like. And here we go. That's Gem's Dragon. So remember the pink Mormodes and all the, the spots that coalesced into lines? They broke apart and peppered across the whole flower. And the Mormodi shape, all the twisted and contorted qualities are gone. And it looks like the color of a Mormodes and the shape of the Cygnotes. So here's another example, Cygnotes lamanii and Mormodes sinuata, the red color of the Mormodes and the shapely flowers of the lamanii. You cross this together and you get wine delight. This was very popular back in the 80s, widely distributed, cloned, probably a million plants have been cloned of wine delight. And then here's some more modern hybrid where Vorzavixii is crossed with exotic treat, starting to get the hang of it. So this is what those look like. My gosh, look at the red lip and the spotting on there. And this one looks like a, a leopard, just fantastic flower count and flower shape. Spotted hornet. And then this hybrid, Mormodes andicola and Vorsavixii, makes John Noggle. Beautifully shaped flowers and colors. Look at this one. Might be my favorite with the pink lip. And look at that spotting with the little rings around there. John Noggle. So let's talk about catacetums. So catacetums 
have pollen ejecting triggers located on the underside of the column. This is very unusual. These flowers shoot out their pollen. They have male and female flower forms. There's a term to describe this because these male and female flower forms are sexually dimorphic. There is a male flower with male sexual parts and then there's a female flower with female parts. And so in order to pollinate, you have to have both sexes in order for it to work. The male flowers are short-lived and the female flowers are long-lived. They're the easiest to grow and they mature quite quickly and they make excellent hobby plants. And so here is Catacetum peleotum. The flowers are large and showy. You can see my model's hand there and gives you a sense of the scale of the flower. That lip actually from the tip of the lateral sepal to the tip of the lateral sepal is close to five inches across. This is a huge flower, Peleotum. Then there's Catacetum expansum, named for its broad expanded lip. And here it's easy to see that pollen ejecting trigger coming out underneath the column there. The slightest touch of that trigger and the pollen is ejected. Then there's Catacetum tenebrosum. This was once called the black orchid. It's, it's tenebrosum. It has dark shadowy flower color, but the lip is always a contrasting chartreuse. There's Catacetum spitzii. This is a recent introduction from Brazil. It was only maybe within the last 10 or 15 years that these plants were available in North America. Spitzii is very showy. Then there's Catacetum denticulatum. Those of you who have grown Catacetums from me are probably aware of the miniature Catacetums that I've been breeding and denticulatum is the parent that does that. There is Catacetum sanguinium. Now I was giving this talk, I was in, Can I was in Canada. I have, we have a Canadian listening in. I was in Canada, it was in, uh, However, it was in uh, Toronto, and uh, I put this picture up on the, on the screen, and people started laughing and chuckling and pointing towards me because I'm standing up by the screen. And then I could hear people say, monkey face, monkey face, and more laughter. And, and I was wondering what was going on, and I, and I apparently looked a little uncomfortable <laughs> And a guy in the front row says, not you, the picture, which only made matters worse. And so can everybody see the monkey face here? The eyes, right? Then here's the nose, the lips and the chin. All right, so I took this picture. I never noticed it, but uh, yeah, so, but yeah, and it's not the monkey face orchid, but there is kind of a little monkey face quality there sanguinium. So catacetums are sexually dimorphic. So and they have a, se a floral sexual dimorphism is the proper scientific term. That means there's male and female flower forms. The male flowers are large, showy, and colorful and have the pollen ejection and triggers. We've only seen pictures of male flowers. The female flowers, well, they're helmet shaped. And regardless of the species, the female flowers look the same. So for species identification, you can't use female flowers because they look the same regardless of the species they belong to. And so let's look at some female flowers. So here's the male Peleotum, large, showy, colorful, highly fragrant. Here's the female green helmet. Here is the male flower of Lucius, long inflorescence sticking up there, highly fragrant. Here's the female flower, green helmet. 
How about Tenebrosum, the male flower, dark, shadowy, mysterious, attractive female flower? You guessed it, green helmet. And how about the pollinization of these things? It must be confusing for the pollinators. The flowers are totally different from one another. So how could the pollinator possibly know what to do? Catacetums are pollinated by male euglossine bees. That's it. Now there's a lot of species of male euglossine bees. And in fact, often it's only one species responsible for the pollinization of a certain species of catacetums. These male euglossine bees collect the floral fragrances off the flower and they put it on their hind legs. And the theory is when they get just the right combination and quantity of these essential oils, they become highly attractive to female euglossine bees. Very important, of course. All catacetums, regardless of the species that they are, have this flowers, regardless of sex, have the same fragrance. So the male and female flowers smell the same, but the male flowers smell more. And so here is a male euglossing bee. They're metallic looking stingless bees. They're solitary. Here's one landed on a flower. Oops. And you can see the pollinia attached to its thorax. There's the pollen. And hind legs, you can see the pockets. And here is a female flower. The helmet shaped flower is a confined space. So when the euglossian bee lands on the flower and crawls up inside there to access the fragrance oils that are at the top of the helmet, it orients the euglossian bee in just the right way so that the pollinia is placed right here in this stigmatic opening. So here you can see the pollen wafer. And can you see, let me here, let's do this. So right here where that line is, is the opening to the stigmatic cavity. And so you can see we're very close to dropping in there, but it takes a very precise positioning. If the, if the euglossian bee is too big or too small, the flower will never get pollinated. So let's summarize this a bit. The male catacetum flower is large, showy, and highly fragrant. It also has a lot of essential oils on it because the euglossian bee needs to go to the male flower first, right? Get the pollen and then go to the female flower. So then it's a good thing that the male catacetum flower is large and showy. It attracts the pollinator. But if the pollinator could harvest all those essential oils in one visit to a male flower, then that's not helpful in reproduction because he'll never go to the female. So the male catacetum evolved a, a, a euglossine bee shoeing mechanism, a pollinate, pollen ejecting trigger. When that bee gets on that flower and starts sucking away at that pollen or the, the essential oils, the pollen is triggered and whack, knocks the euglossine bee off the flower, a painful hit soon not to be forgotten. So the euglossian bee doesn't like the look of the male flower and flies away from it. He just got slapped, picks up the scent of the female catacetum flower, takes a look at it and it's non-threatening. It looks nothing like the male flower that slaps you with pollinia, crawls up inside the helmet and upon exiting, deposit is the pollinia into the stigmatic cavity. Of course, you glossian bees aren't known for their memory skills. And since they haven't acquired enough of those essential oils, they return to the easy pickings of the male flower, start wiping it up again and whack. Oh yeah, that wasn't too pleasant. Fly away, 
return to another female flower and repeat this process over and over and over again for thousands of years, right? Generation after generation of male euglossing bee. This is why you should only think of the fun over cocktails. You can wow your friends with your knowledge of plant sex. So, because I know some of you don't believe me, I have a video clip that I'd like to share with you. Now you have to watch very quickly when the pollen is ejected from the male flower, it's flying at about 16 frames per second. So if you blink, you will miss it. So watch carefully. Here we go. Over. Here's slow motion. Boom. And ultra slow motion. See the foot come up. He's going to come up. He's going to touch the trigger. And boom. That was very slow. You could see the wings beating on that euglossing bee. So let's play it again in real time. Now you know what to look for and see how quick it is. It is a millisecond. Okay, here we go. Over. <laughs> and you can see how forceful the hit is knocking that euglossian bee off the flower. Fascinating. Pow. Pretty good. The guy who took this, remember in real time, it's a fraction of a second. It took him days to get that shot that we just saw. All right, so enough of that kind of talk. Let's talk about the hybrids at Catacetums. We've talked about the species. So you take Peleotum and you cross it with Expansum and that makes Orchid Glade. And Orchid Glade's a very good parent. I use it in breeding all the time. Orchid Glade was crossed back to Expansum and that made Susan Fuchs. Denticulatum was crossed with Portuguese star, making the first of the miniature catacetums, making Chuck Taylor. Chuck Taylor lives in Edmonton, Canada. It's still snowing in Edmonton, Canada. And Chuck bought one of these plants for me in the spring, grew it up and flowered it probably six months before I did. He grows in his basement and they have very long days in that part of the world and was able to grow and bloom a plant months before I did. So we named it after him. And this is Chuck Taylor. Then there's uh, Milana Davidson, Denticulatum crossed with Penang. And the Milanas have been very successful. High flower count, beautiful arrangement. And the colors have been from red to white. Then there's Dentigreen and with Denticulatum and Tigrinum making a particularly attractive combination. Then some other examples. This has been one of the, just the premier mini catacetum crosses. Just dwarf little plants. They flower three, four times a year with just beautiful cascades of flowers coming over the sides. Then there's Fong Sing. Oh, remember Monkey Face and Catacetum Sanguinium? Look at Jose Abalo. It's a hybrid with Sanguinium. And you take that Sanguinium, you can see the eyes and the kind of the crummy looking nose, kind of an ugly looking monkey. Cross that with Orchid Glade and it, and it turns everything over and it makes the beautiful Fong Sing. And the Fong Sings have come in a lot of different colors and are quite shapely. And so Fred Clark Aras, I heard you guys talking about that when I logged in. So a Fred Clark Ara is a combination of three genera, a Mormodes, which we've talked about, Catacetums, which have the sexually dimorphic flowers, and a Cloesia. Fred Clark Aras have perfect blooms. So even though a large portion of its genetic makeup is a Catacetum, the flowers are perfect. That is, they've got both male and female parts. 
They're long lasting flowers. Fred Clark Aris can last five, six weeks with good under good care. They've got decent flower size and good flower count and they're vigorous and easy grow. And did I mention already? They make excellent hobby plants. And so here is the Grex of Fred Clark Gara. This is how, how it started. Rebecca Northern, Cloesia, Rebecca Northern was crossed with Mormodi sinuata and that made Mormodia painted desert. And painted desert was made by Roy Tokunaga in Hawaii, right? And on the big island there, or not the big island, on Oahu, around the corner from you guys. And so I got some plants from Roy and I was impressed because the lip was so dark. I took Painted Desert and I crossed it with Donna Wise. And Donna Wise has very dark petals and sepals. And so I was looking for rich, dark colors. And this was the first one to bloom. The first Fred Clark Ara After Dark came out spotted. Thinking to myself, spots? What the heck? A year later, I flowered some more and they were all spotted. And so this is when I named the cross After Dark. I just kind of like names like that for catacetums. And then a year later, I bloomed this one. And so that was pretty impressive. I uh, had just purchased one of the new fangled SLR digital camera. And I got down in front of this thing and I, and I had it on auto focus and auto shutter speed, you know, auto aperture and tried to take a picture and the camera would just zoom in and out. And, I'm, and I, just, I was just barely learning how to use it and I'm pretty sure it was broken. So I went over to a red Cattleya flower, a bench or two away, and it zoomed right in and really sharp and took a great photo. I got back to this and sure enough, it would just zoom in and out, zoom in and out. And so I decided I could put it on manual focus and I took this picture and, you know, thinking about it later, I realized that this flower is black and black is the absorption of all light. And so there wasn't enough light reflecting from the surface of the flower in through the viewfinder of the camera for it to see the flower. It was too dark. It was just like a black hole. Well, then this one bloomed and this is black pearl and this is the one that was cloned and widely distributed. Very, uh, one of the first to bloom of the Grex, very easy to grow. But there were other black ones. There is this one here. This is, um, this is black diamond. This is taken in full sun. Here is black night. Some people were saying, well, they're really not black. You shouldn't call it black. So, so for those of you who are, have trouble with color, this is gray in the background. This is green. That is black. Now, all right, so black is an unusual color, right? But perception is reality. So if something looks black, you're going to call it black. That's what these flowers look like. They look black, so they're black. This is one called Freuer Bach. A good friend of mine, Renata Schmidt, been an American Orchid Society judge for about 40 years, was visiting and she had said to me that she had never won a first class certificate in her life as in a as a grower and exhibitor of orchids. And so I had a, a, a seedling of Fred Clark after dark and I gave it to her. She took it home and she grew it beautifully. But she came back a year or two later and she said, Fred, here, I want you to have this plant back. Oh, what are you talking about? She says, no, I can't bear the responsibility of growing it. And it's like, oh, come on, Renata, you're killing me. So, let, so I divided it in half and I gave her half and I kept half. And so I did finally bloom it. And this one is, is she's got an FCC plant on her hands too one day if she ever exhibits it. But, I, but not all of them were black. This is a black cherry. And this received a first class certificate. There's 107 flowers on four inflorescences. And then, you know, you've made it in the orchid world. When you see in Las Vegas that you have a slot machine with the black orchid 
name and the picture of your black orchid is on the slot machine. Now, this was quite a surprise to me, of course, when I went to Las Vegas because I had no idea this was going on. And so I thought I felt pretty lucky at the moment when I saw this. So I whipped out 20 bucks and I started playing my 20 bucks. Well, uh, I wouldn't recommend playing the black slot machine, but you know what really got, got me was it right next to the coolest slot machine ever. The black orchid slot machine was the white orchid slot machine. Those guys got no class over there. There should have been about 20 black orchid slot machines. I don't know. So with Fred Clark Aras, I started to breed other colors. And so how about red ones with spots? Or how about greenish colors with brown picatees? Or what about bright green flowers or green with spots? Or new colors all together, like no doubt. Or how about this one, Doubtless? These are very impressive. So we go from black to white in just a couple generations of breeding with marvelous spots and excellent shape. Pure green. And so Fred Clark Aris have come a long way, almost every color now. The only one we don't have is orange. But the new breeding that I've been doing and that I'm very excited about is catamodes breeding. And some time ago, I made a hybrid of denticulatum and mormodes laurentiana, and it made a hybrid called dragon's tail. The lip of the flower, when you saw the whole inflorescence, looked like the mythical you know, scales that you would find on the tail of a dragon, really unusual. The only problem was the plants of dragon tail were quite large and the flowers were quite small. It's kind of not what you're really breeding for. You'd like to have a small plant with a lot of big flowers. So it just sat on my bench for several years and I finally decided to make a hybrid with it. And so I crossed dragon's tail with orchid glade and it made dragons, and Grex called dragon's glade. And it was a home run of just epic proportion. The flower size is large. There's a ton of flowers on the inflorescence. They're well arranged. They have long life. They got everything you want. And so I started making more and more hybrids with them. So this is one that got an AM from the American Orchid Society. But look at these different ones. This dark one, look at this yellow one. And then look at this guy, black as can be, Dragon's Glade. Oh man, if you see those listed and you like catacetums and you wanna get an edge on what the best is, don't forget Dragon's Glade. And then, about at the same time, I made this Grex that we ended up naming Darconium. I guess I've been watching too many, uh, too many Marvel movies. <laughs> Darconium, a uh, bit like plutonium or whatever that stuff's called. So we took Dragon's Tail and crossed it with John Burchett. And look at the color of these. Just huge flowers, as black as can be. But some of them look like this with beautifully contrasting lips. Others look like this one that got a first class certificate. So look out for Darconium too. Darconium, Dragon's Tail, and, Dragon, and uh, Dragon's Glade. And so how do you grow all this stuff? All right, we've been talking about all these things. So let's talk about how to grow them. So, they like monsoonal summer conditions. Hmm, sounds like Hawaii to me. They want to get fertilized every time you water. You want to use an open, well-drained media because you're going to water a lot. You repot and divide just as new growth is starting, and you don't begin to water until the new growth has new roots that are three to six inches long. This is very important. So the environmental conditions they prefer are temperatures like this. Summer highs between 80 and 95. Summer lows, not much colder than 60. 
winter temperatures really don't matter, but they don't like going below 50 degrees. Really the best winter low is about 60. They like high light levels and they like high humidity. Did I just describe Hawaii or most of Hawaii? They love growing on palm trees in nature. If you see a stand of palm trees in Catacetum country, it's worth the effort to walk up to the side of the tree. They naturally establish themselves in the, the, at the joint where the leaf connects to the trunk. And if you've ever shucked a palm tree, how dirty is the point where the leaf connects to the tree? It's really dirty, right? There's all kinds of dust and droppings and it's almost like ink in there, right? You touch it, it gets you, it'll stain your skin and your clothes. That is a high rich nutrient source and that's where the catechisms wanna grow. But they're tough. I saw plants growing on telephone poles in Venezuela and just out in the harshest conditions, thriving on a telephone pole. I saw catastetums growing out of a guy's house. Now I can't, I, now I know orchids don't have feelings, right? But I have feelings. And if I was sleeping in this house, I might be a little nervous about the wiring job over here on the right hand side. But the catacetum is perfectly happy. And so in nature, it's hot and wet in the summer and cool and dry in the winter. Orchids evolve growing in nature, right? And the catacetums have been growing in nature for millions of years. So you need to respect the environment in which they grow in in order to master their culture. Watering begins when the roots are three to six inches long. Watering too early can cause bulb rot. So here's a plant in the early spring. You can see the new growth emerging no water. In fact, you can see the pseudobulbs here, the leafless pseudobulbs, because they're dormant, are nice and plump. There's plenty of moisture stored in those pseudobulbs. A month or so after this growth is there, you can see it elongating considerably, and you can see the first green root tips emerging from the base of the plant. This is when you get ready to water. The roots are not three to six inches long yet. You still wait. This is when you buy a new hose. You move the plant closer to water. You mix up some fertilizer. Just don't water yet. Now, about a month later, those roots have drilled down into the potting media. They're three to six inches long. And this is when you begin to water and fertilize. When you, and so here's what the stages look like. You can see no new growth, just sprouting, sprouting growth with roots initiates, roots lengthening longer, longer. And when that new growth is about this size is when the roots are long enough. When you start to water, the plant enters into a rapid growth stage and you can see that new growth developing very quickly. You continue to water and the plant begins to flower and they're magnificent. You bring them into judging or to the meeting and everyone's so envious of your exotic orchid. And then all of a sudden, Thanksgiving or late October rolls around and your plant starts to look like heck. The leaves start to turn yellow. You might get some black spots on it. This is your plant communicating with you, telling you that Winter is imminent. The plant has matured its growth and it's dropping its leaves in preparation for winter dormancy. About a month later, all the green leaves have turned yellow. Most have dropped off. Hopefully you have evidence of one, two, three, four, five, six flower spikes on your plant from that season. And then you stop watering until the new growth has new roots that are three to six inches long. Now, I give this talk all around the world and some Canadians, it's weird I'm talking about Canadians so much, came up with this idea. In fact, there were some growers uh, in central Canada that were taking pots and they were pressing them into jars with water underneath. 
The plant wasn't touching water, but it created a super humid environment underneath the plant. And this humid environment helped overwinter the catacetums in extremely low humidity conditions like you have where it's freezing outside for months on end and a very effective technique. So I've been sharing this idea whenever I have an opportunity. Now, when I was in Venezuela, uh, a few years ago, I was able to see catacetums growing and it was fascinating. So here's a quite a large plant. You can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 12 pseudobulbs here. This plant has dealt with 12 wet and dry seasons and looks just fine. I oops, pulled the plant up and you can see the new growth and you can see the new white roots emerging. I asked our guide when the rainy season was going to start, and they said it was still a month away. You flip the plant over and you can see how extensive these new white roots are. The plant has grown its roots in anticipation of the rainy season. So a new root system is really effective at picking up nutrients and moisture. And remember, catacetums have a dormancy period. So they grow their roots before the nutrients and moisture become available, and then they rapidly grow in the summer. And so this, it, it helps the plant do better. This is why you wait to water until the new roots come out. Well, this is what you look like when you collect orchids. Am I rocking the crocodile Dundee look? <laughs> And remember Catacetum sanguinium? The sanguinium is the blood red Catacetum. And you may notice that my index finger and my thumb here are kind of not in a natural position. And you may notice on my shirt that there's these red spots. <laughs> and these red spots have to do with the fact of me collecting this Catacetum sanguinium because they grow where cactus live. They grow in a semi-deciduous forest because cactus like that, because it's dry for many months. And I impaled myself with a cactus. I collected, I didn't drop my catacetum sanguinium plants, by the way. I did baptize them with my own blood, however. And so here's what my greenhouse looks like in about July, or August. It's luxurious. It's green. It looks tropical. And here's what it looks like in January. All the, most of the leaves have come off the plants. Because we grow hybrids, they're a combination of a lot of different species. And so some species have shorter dormancy rest periods than others. And so when you make hybrids, sometimes you get plants that hold their green leaves for quite a while into the dormant cycle. None of the plants you see here pictured have been watered in at least one month. Even though you've stopped watering doesn't mean they won't bloom and every plant on this top shelf is in flower. You could see that. And so a well-grown plant will continue to bloom even during dormancy. And so in summary, you want to wait. I know I've said this about 10 times already, right? You want to wait to irrigate until the roots are three to six inches long. This is very important to being a successful grower. You want to have a well-drained potting media because you're going to water like crazy in the summer months. When in active growth, you want to make sure that you're fertilizing frequently. I fertilize every watering with one half teaspoon per gallon. You want to reduce irrigations when the leaves begin to turn yellow. You want to simulate the end of the rainy season. Then when you stop watering, when the bulbs are leafless or by Christmas day, whatever comes first. You repot and divide with the onset of the new growth. Now, this isn't true with all orchids, but with catacetum, all catacetums, all cycnoches, all marmotes, all cloeceas, grow their roots right after the new growth starts. So, and because they only grow their roots once a year, 
the only time to repot is in the early spring. If you repot in mid growth, your plant will not be happy with you and you'll set it back. So you'll want to repot early spring with the new growth. And if I did forget to mention earlier in the talk, these make excellent hobby plants. And thank you all very much. And now all of you will know how to grow and beautiful, grow and flower beautiful catacetums. Thank you. I'm in love. So thank you, Fred. It was a fantastic talk and your pictures were marvelous. We're gonna open it up now for question and answer. So if you have a question, you can unmute. Hey, Fred, this is Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> I, what, um, do, do you know the, um, the, the orchids that you grow? Can we buy it down here? Yes, you can. Now, okay. I know that Brad and Ben Jr. are working on getting a group order together. Yep. And okay. so if you, if you reach out to them, you can throw in with the rest yep. of the gang and you'll get a discount too. Now my my okay. catacetums okay. are yeah my catacetum sales yep. are, are very popular. So and in about July I will have the new catacetum list will come out. Okay, okay, great. And and it so so the watering you said is just like like um when the leaves are start turning yellow, stop watering right. That, right. That's the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so don't overwater otherwise it's gonna rot. Yeah, in, in nature, it's not raining in the winter. And so the plants evolve to be dry and they're perfectly happy being dry. They don't care. In fact, oh. I haven't watered my plant since January 1st. And what month is it now? It's, it's eight, I haven't watered them in three months, not a drop. More, almost four. I'm getting ready to water, but not a drop of water has been on my plants. Now you guys, you don't have such a long winter because of your environment and the plants usually start growing sooner there, but you judge your watering and your stopping of watering on what the plant tells you, not what, not what a guy like me tells you. You got to look at your plant and know, okay, those roots are ready to water. Okay, start watering. And sometimes in the tropics, your plant might go dormant sooner. It might go dormant as early as October. So just depends on what the plant tells you. Okay. Hey, great. Thanks a lot, Fred. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, Fred, I have a question regarding plants that have both male and female flowers. Mm -hmm. How does the plant decide whether to have one or the other? Oh, that's an excellent question. And so, so large, robust plants get that way because they have access to lots of light, nutrients, and moisture, and time. Large, robust plants are most likely female because the seed pod is pollinated during the summer and then the plant has to carry the seed pod through the dormant winter rest, which could be three or four months long, and live to disperse the seed for the next generation. Plants that are small, grown poorly, too much shade, not enough water, no fertilizer, will most often be male because producing pollen isn't difficult. It's carrying seed pods that's hard, and so only large robust plants can do that and thus they are female. Now, sometimes the first blooming of a plant, like, cause a lot of the catacetums will flower three, four times a year. And sometimes in the early spring, you see a higher percentage of plants blooming female within the subsequent bloomings of that plant being male. It's fascinating. What, what about the timing of having both female and male flowers available? Well, that, you know, so I didn't talk about this, but sometimes you wait years 
in order to make a cross. Because if all you get is male flowers, what are you going to do? And then sometimes plants bloom stubbornly female, right? And now you don't have any pollen. So you've, and so it's, it can be tricky. So what I, I try to uh, improve my odds. And so with my breeding plants, I'll usually let one get really large and then I'll make a division of that plant. And so the real large plant will most likely be female and the little small crummy division will end up being male. So at least I have male female opportunities. Doesn't always work, but it improves, improves my odds. So there's a there's a question on chat is um, Mon Millennium Magic witchcraft. That's a catacetum. Yeah, it's a cycnoches and marmotes and a and a cycnoches and marmotes and a catacetum. Yeah, you grow it just like we were talking about. Hey, Fred, I have a question about um, the sick key species. Yeah. You ever had issues with new growth developing up higher up on the bulb instead of at the base? Yeah. What is the issue? Like, what causes that? Usually it's a basal rot. And on catacetums, there are uh, viable eyes that could either develop into flower spikes or to growth, depending on the, on the conditions. And so it's true with Catacetum, Cygnotes, Marmotes, Cloesias, all those plants. So if the eyes at the bottom of the pseudobulb fail, it activates an eye farther up on the plant. And so you see that quite commonly in Cygnotes. Cygnotes in nature don't form large clumps. In fact, when I've seen uh, two, I guess two species of Cygnotes in the wild, Ventricosum and uh, Chlorochylon, and uh, they have one or two bulbs. It's very common for the back bulbs to wither up. And um, so if you are struggling with this a lot, and you take a good look at the plant, you may see that the base of the plant is rotted or partially rotted. And so you can treat with a fungicide like subdue for treating for pythium and uh, subdue terrachlor mix could, can, uh, can be effective at preventing that, that rot. I usually don't do that because I'm, you know, it's a lot of work to do it. And uh, so what you can do is you can wrap moss around that point on the plant and let the root, roots root into it. And then they'll grow down and root down into the media down below. If it's too high up the bulb, sometimes I just leave it on there and wait till the following year when it starts to sprout a new growth again. Then you twist it off and you, and you repot it with the development of the new roots. Any other questions for Fred? Now is the time to ask. So if I now have a long leaf on it, it's okay to be watering, even though it's, I mean, cause it's spring, right? Or do I have to open, look at the roots? Well, usually you can see how long the roots are cause they emerge from the base of the plant. It's pretty, pretty yeah. easy to see them. Yeah. And yeah. so when, so if you watch the root and it took a, a month to grow two inches long, you know, in, in two months, it's going to be four to six inches long. So then that's when you start. Yeah. So watering is okay now. Well, I don't know how long the roots are. <laughs> how okay. long are the roots? Yeah. Some are six inches coming out from the top. Yeah. So if you've got roots that are long enough, time to water. Okay. Thank you. One of the, the, things with, the things with catacetums is you don't want to be in too big of a hurry to start watering. You guys have lots of natural humidity and the plants shriveling up due to lack of humidity is probably not a problem 
anyone in Hawaii is going to have. And so you can you can probably wait a little longer than most people can before you start watering and the plant will be just fine. You said? Yeah. This is Calvin Kumano. Yeah. Just hey. wanted to let you know I talked to Leah today. She said to tell you hello and everything's fine with her. Ah, oh, that's good to hear. I haven't I haven't talked to her in 10 years. So <laughs> I used to see her every month. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. She said to say hello anyway. All right. Well, good, good. Say hi. Well, next time you see her, say I send my messages. Uh, just to remind people that if they want to purchase uh, plants, I guess in the next two to three weeks, we'll try to put an order together. So you can either contact me or Brad. And I think there's only one catacetum hybrid available right now. But so, they, you can look on the website for uh, anything. So, so if, we, uh, if we're inspired and interested in the catacetums, can we... Um, can we wait till July and will Fred still give us a group order in July? Yes. Okay. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I missed the earlier part of the meeting, but I just joined. So I didn't get to hear the first part, but um, I have a uh, Noichi's here. I was just wondering if you can just take a look at it. Uh, here it is. Ooh. Nice. Yeah, what's it? What's its name? Okay, Taiwan Gold Orange. Oh, it's the Cygnotes, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. so so that's plenty now, big to start watering. Okay, uh, okay, so I should start watering it then and fertilizing okay just wondering i haven't done so since november yeah no it's ready now okay, okay. thank mm -hmm. you thank you very much yeah thanks for sharing <laughs> mm -hmm. what causes the variegation in the uh, millennium magic Nah, it's been cloned too much. Mm. It's probably a clonal mutation. Yeah. So Millennium Magic was cloned from a plant that I have here at my nursery. Was the I have the original plant that was the source of the clone material, and uh, so I'm pretty sure they cloned the clone um, because the first guy to clone it was Mr. Cow, and James Fong sold oh. them. And then people got a hold of those plants and cloned those. And so I think it's just over cloning. Yeah, no, no one's reached out to me to ask for another piece of, of you know, original tissue. So it's got to be clones of a clone out there now. Is, is the website on the blue thing in the email? I'm, I'm trying to look it up on my phone, but I can't see it. Your website. I think if you just Google SVO orchids, you'll find them. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. But if you're going to do a group order, make sure you put it all together in a group. Otherwise, I won't know it's a group order. Yeah. Check. Thank yeah. you. When would you recommend... Um, dividing a plant you... uh, uh, in the early spring so usually for you guys that would probably be february or march like how many bulbs should we should we keep it to like three or yeah on catacetums you can go down to two bulbs they're fine with two bulbs usually and sometimes even one bulb believe it or not but uh i usually like to keep them around two bulb sizes. That way you're assured that it'll flower that, that summer. Thank you. And um, is there any chance to get growth from back bulbs? Yes. Yeah, they sprout easily. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, Fred, this our is daughter Andy. Lives, excuse me. Fred, our daughter lives very close to you, and uh, we had a wonderful trip through your nursery. You weren't there, but uh, one of one of your uh, Carlo, Carlos saying, was there. Uh, yeah, uh, guided us through us, and yeah. it was just an amazing, amazing place. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, we work hard. <laughs> it's a labor of love around here. So I think Sandy has a question. Go ahead. Yes, I was the one who asked about the witchcraft. I yeah. had that plant. And for lack of knowing what to do with it, I've been watering it every day. All year round. And it goes dormant, but it still comes up with a new shoot in late winter. Am I doing it more harm by watering it that much? Well, it sounds like it's out of cycle, maybe. It might be confused. You know, in Hawaii, you're fairly day neutral and the climate year round is fairly stable. So catacetums live where there's in nature where there's more of a day night temperature differential and a very poignant wet dry cycle. And so I would, uh, I would uh, water less in the winter and water more in the summer if I was you and, and you get the plant in its natural cycle. The, uh, I would say this, that I firmly believe that there's like a biological clock in the plant. And if the plant doesn't have a, the proper winter rest, it doesn't put up the growth in the flowering as well as it could if it did have the proper winter rest. Um, and so with that being said, I, I would suggest that, you know, when the leaves start to turn yellow and start to drop off and the you know, the bulbs mature, the leaves start to then back off on the watering and uh, let the plant kind of go more, help it go dormant. If you keep watering and it's warm out at night, the plant doesn't know winter's coming. Mm -hmm. And so it gets confused. So uh, it may not kill it, but you know, your plant's probably suffering a little bit. It's just hard to tell how much until you get it on the right cycle, then you'll, then you'll know. So, so Fred, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if somebody goes to your website, um, you have cultural sheets on catacetum or they can sign up for your, I don't know if it's a newsletter, but some sort of email list where when it's catacetum season, for or, you know you, you send in from cultural information out to people who um buy plants from you is that still correct yeah i have a newsletter that i send out periodically there's no time schedule on it the uh but usually it coincides with important uh timing for catacetums there's uh cultural sheets and if you want more information i have a whole bunch of of uh, PDFs of articles that I've written that I'd be happy to send you that will expand your mind even further on the subject of uh, catacetums, well, and cattleyas and other things as well. Yeah, most, mostly it reminds me what I'm doing wrong, but uh, I, I, I have a lot to learn. Well, that's the fun thing about orchids, right? I mean, they're, they take a lot of learning and you know, that's a weird thing about orchid people, right? And you probably, maybe you guys have noticed this about yourselves. Uh, orchid people have uh, generally, not everyone, but most of us have a lifelong affair with learning, right? It's Correct. important for us to, to explore and find out new things and discover stuff. And we just have a natural curiosity and orchid people, you know, you, you see it all the time, so. Thank you.